Hello and welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me here today. You know, many of the kids I've worked with are exceptionally bright, but because they think and learn differently, traditional school environments can be challenging and they can struggle with engagement and often ask, what's the point? Well, today's guests are going to discuss the importance of creating space and time for reflection, reasoning, existential questioning, and the sharing and communicating of ideas. They're going to talk about deep learning and how that can engage students. My guests are Jim Hahn and Dr. John Cassie. Jim is the founder of Qualia, the school for deeper learning. He brings his cutting edge educational model to a new level with his democratic educational philosophy, unique teaching and mentoring approach, and innovative deep learning curriculum. Dr. Cassie has worked in independent school education for 25 years, serving in virtually every teaching and leadership capacity schools have to offer. He has won awards for his writing and has presented at conferences and forums on learning and games in the U.S. and abroad. Millions of kids struggle with learning, processing, and social-emotional difficulties. These challenges interfere with their ability to reach their full potential. Dr. Karen Wilson is here to help. Her extensive background in pediatric neuropsychology and higher education have prepared her for this unique mission. Listen as she delivers content to inform, educate, and empower parents and educators. This will enable you to identify challenges that kids face and get them on the road to achieving their full potential. This is Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. Jim and John, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Karen. Thanks for having us. I'm so glad that you're here today. Same. So glad because we, we've been spending a lot of time on the podcast talking about kids who think and learn differently, those who struggle with reading because of dyslexia, attention issues related to ADHD. Many are very, very bright. And early on, the focus is often to remediate kids in areas where they need support but there's also a need to develop other skills that are important for enhancing learning and for preparing them for adulthood, which we have had conversations about when I think about critical thinking. And that's why I wanted to have you both on the podcast today, because it's often an overlooked area, particularly when kids are struggling in some way. Yeah, that's definitely true, right? And and our focus here at at Qualia is really about the deepest possible critical thinking that we can get from, from our students. And we see great depth of thinking, even with students in our sixth grade, right? By virtue of the, uh, by virtue of the programs that we, that we have here that are unique to us, right? Um, think of great ideas, uh, which is our six through 12 philosophy program. Every student at Qualia takes philosophy each year, along with their other core academic classes, right? And philosophy, by virtue of being one of these kind of humanities courses that sort of at the foundation of all the other humanities, right? By having students do philosophy and really grapple with difficult ideas that do not yield a yes or no or a black and white answer, students are able to to more rapidly develop some of those critical thinking uh, circuits in the brain and then apply them in all the other classes, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I would just, I would add to that, that we've been uh, making, and I'll put that in quotes, students take philosophy for 16 years yeah. now. Yeah, right. And I might've had one complaint uh, right. in, in, over the, of that time period. Uh, and I was doing this also at a, a previous uh, private school that I worked at. And, and similarly, what you find is that they they are ready to take those training wheels off uh, and do real critical thinking a lot earlier than we give them credit for. Yeah. And to go back to your point at the beginning uh, about kind of this mix of, of, of brilliance and, and, and uh, challenges that you see in a lot of kids, um, they, they, they really, when they're, when they're excited about thinking and when you are honoring their own thoughts and ideas, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they forget to be anxious about the things that make them anxious about school, whether it's, it's diagnosed learning differences right. or, or aspects of the school environment that, uh, that have made them anxious in the past. 
um, they, they really get caught up in, in using this new capacity that's emerging in, in pre-adolescence and, and, and kind of early high school. Uh, and uh, we give them an opportunity to, to do that and in, in ways that uh, uh, where they realize that their, their voice and their ideas can actually be valuable. Indeed. Yeah. It's transformative, Karen. And it really sounds like it, because when I think about school, the school experience for so many kids, you know, we think about reading, writing, math, science early on, but oftentimes philosophy isn't thrown in the mix. Yet, you know, the end goal is not to have kids who can read proficiently, even though that's important for ana analyzing information. Writing is important, but we want them to actively and skillfully conceptualize, apply knowledge, synthesize information, and evaluate information gathered, because that is really going to prepare them for adulthood, which is what we're doing all along. And so, how, why philosophy? You know, out of all the, uh, the, the, the subjects that you could kind of bring into a curriculum, why philosophy and how early can you introduce this topic and this idea? I'm taking the first part of that, we teach philosophy not as a, a, maybe not the way it would be taught at, 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 in college. It's not a, you know, walk them through the history of philosophy. It's not about knowing a little snippet about each of the famous philosophers. Yeah, right, right. Uh, we really de-emphasize the, you know, the whole parade of, of old dead white guys. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and we're, we're much more focused on philosophy as a method. Yeah. And so what is, what is it a method for? Uh, one thing that it does really, really well is uh, to uh, get you outside of the frame that you may find yourself in, whether it's your own way mm -hmm. of uh, sort of uh, a canalized uh, way of looking at the world that might not be serving you well, or if you're in a group of people and they're all sort of thinking the same, yep. a philosopher, someone with philosophical training, um, which can be, you know, uh, uh, high school philosophical training, uh, it puts them head and shoulders above most adults, but someone with that training is going to be able to say, maybe we're asking the wrong question, maybe we're looking at things the wrong um, what if we, you know, what if we turn this whole thing on its head? And so that that ability to ask really incisive and productive questions um, is one one uh, one really big part of it. And there's ample evidence from from organizations that care about teaching philosophy to young children that you can do this with kindergarten age students. You just have to structure the questions in a way that they become accessible to whatever the age group that you're talking about, right? And, and we certainly uh, have seen any number of uh, students who come to us in grade six or grade nine, you know, whenever, and they've been from an environment where they're not doing philosophy because we're it, at least in Southern California. So far as I know, we're it, okay? And you know they 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 need a few months to get their to get their bearings because they're not accustomed to being in a class that's really about questioning questions and going deeply right and and there's no test at the end right so it, it sort of destabilizes them a little bit which is in my judgment all to the good right because then they see that we mean it when we say. No, we want you to go deeper. There's there's more that you haven't said. There's more that you know that you're you're letting on to. So let me. Yeah, our faculty are well trained to do this kind of work. Our classes are very small, so there's no there's no back row in a qualia classroom, right? There's five, six, seven, eight kids in a class, so the teacher can direct uh, his or her attention to each student with the, the right amount of individual attention. Well, in that kind of a classroom where what you care about is asking a meaningful question and then going deeper, 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 you can bring anyone along. Another philosophical skill uh, that we emphasize a lot is um, what you do with an idea. So, you know, okay, I have an idea and, and kind of in, in the general culture, it's my job to to ferociously defend that. 
Yeah. And often, often in the midst of, of, of a real conversation with, with someone that's a worthy, worthy adversary or interlocutor, uh, you realize maybe you're not as sure as you were. Right. And so we teach our kids to have intellectual humility, to have the ability to say, oh, wait, I'm seeing this differently now. Um, and so we, we celebrate, we recognize, celebrate uh, uh, and applaud um, when kids change their minds about things. Um, which I think is, is going to be very different from, say, being on a high school debate team, for example. Right. Right. And now, Karen, to get back to the very, very first thing you said, namely you were citing you know, students who have dyslexia diagnoses, dysgraphia diagnoses, uh, uh, twice exceptional, those kind of students. In our classrooms, because our faculty are trained and are accustomed to working with students with these kinds of needs, those just become standard learning supports that are, are sort of routine, at least in our environment. And so we're able to move by supporting students with whatever those needs happen to be into the framework of thinking deeply mm-hmm. about meaningful questions much more rapidly because we're ready to support those things. If they, uh, you know, if if they, they are a feature of a young learner's life, and if they're not, uh, fine too, whatever. Yeah, I think right. we, we provide the support, but um, without any sort of uh, big drama. Around yeah, exactly. That. And so, so if you're in classes, your 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 identity in that class is guy who thinks a certain way about this kind of topic or person who reasons in a certain right. sort of way, your identity is not dyslexia or, you know, kid computer to type. Uh, right. So I think we do a good job of, of, of kind of hitting that, that sweet spot where we are teaching to the passions and then kind of remediating on the side as necessary. Yeah. Now, not all of our kids need remediation. Um, we're, you know, what we're looking for here are kids that are kind of have that, that spark of curiosity, have that. Yeah. That, that interest in the world and, and you get a diversity of different types of learners that way. Yeah. And I think as a small school, we're able to serve all of them um, pretty well. Pretty effectively, yeah. And when I think about the skills that we want adults to have, when I think about the last, <laughs> just the last five years alone, the importance of having intellectual curiosity and intellectual humility <laughs> is so important when you think about, you know, political systems and environment and all the big things that we are concerned about in our world right now, that we need more people to be able to engage in thoughtful analysis, but also be humble and willing to change their viewpoint when they gather more information. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. I mean, look, if you, if you do our program intentionally, you come here you engage with it thoughtfully. You're going to leave this school more able to do what you just said at a younger age than virtually any other educational model will afford you. And that's important because we have to move from acquisition of facts to, again, that thoughtful analysis. Right. Yeah. Because I think so much of school, when we think about it, and at least my early experience, a lot of it was acquisition of facts. And later on, you get the thoughtful analysis, but it sounds like you can get that thoughtful analysis piece earlier yeah, on. No question. And then that becomes a part of who people are as they, as they get older. Right. We, one of the ways that I talk to colleagues about this is to say, you've got two kinds of knowledge that you as an instructor might care about. I will call them the node and the network. Okay. Okay. Code, that's your, those are your factual pieces, right? Um, uh, H2SO4 is sulfuric acid and it behaves this way. I think it's a sulfuric acid, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the major feature of the Clinton administration was uh, radical uh, depolarization of tension between the United States and an emerging Russia. That's node. Who cares? Okay. What we care about is can you take that and then connect it to something that is 
also a node, but w- the connection is what matters. That's where the critical thinking is, okay? How do you connect these things, okay? To create a web of knowledge that helps you to understand and interpret a very complicated world. Our belief is that in our Great Ideas program, we're giving students unique tools to make those connections, okay? Because that's what philosophy as a as a method uniquely does, okay? And that gift pays off throughout the lifespan, okay? Because we care as much about the child at 10 or 15 or 18 as we do when they're 40 or 50. We're, we're intentional about this. We know that we can have an influence here when they're in school that will pay off throughout their adulthood. You know, if we, uh, quote unquote, stick the landing. Right. And, you know, I'll say to parents all the time, Jim, Jim, Jim's heard me do this, right? I've got a parent in, you know, in an admissions meeting or whatever, right? And I'll say, okay, so your, your kid is 11. So that means they were born in 2011, right? Yeah. So, so they're going to be 50 in the year 2061. And you see the parent's face, the blood rushes out of their, you know, <laughs> they're horrified. At this. And I said, do you think the world's going to be any less complicated? Or do you think any more? I hadn't thought about that. Well, we think about it. And that's why we emphasize what we emphasize. Because we know that this foundational skill development in thinking itself is what's going to make the difference. And and back to your point uh, about uh, acquisition of facts, you know, all the you know this better than 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 we do probably, Karen, but that all the research shows that those facts are actually only acquired for a month or so. Yeah, right, right. At the, yeah, yeah, yeah. At the most. So what are, you know, what were we doing in school acquiring all those facts? It's perhaps a little depressing to reflect right. back on <laughs> right, that. Right, um, right. <laughs> but I think John and I both at different different points in our careers, and, and I'm guessing you too, had, had a moment where we realized we'd been ill-served by that system and, and had to, I really had to put on the afterburners to kind of acquire my critical thinking yeah. skills in, in graduate so. school. And, and even more so than graduate school, in, in my early years of teaching, when I was yeah. with these, uh, you know, really, really brilliant minds that, that wanted to just run with things and go. They didn't want to be given uh, uh, sort of pat answers and, you know, let's move on. Right. Um, they wanted to, to keep asking why. And be able to serve that and so that's that's philosophy was not actually my uh uh course of study in graduate school it was it was something that i uh, self-taught um later uh as a response to to all of these uh really active really brilliant uh ninth graders mainly that i was that i was working with at a, yeah. at a school i taught at before and what does a query driven curriculum that involves this deep existential questioning look like so if a parent were to think is listening to this podcast and thinking, this sounds like a great academic environment, a great learning environment for my child. What what does that look like? Because it sounds like they're not going to go from reading to math to social studies to science. It's the curriculum and the, the day of that student is going to look very different. Can you give us an idea of what that looks like? Right. It's a great question because we're working right now with our uh, humanities teachers, both both uh, philosophy uh, history as well as uh, literature um, on on some questions that uh, rather than being sort of the specific question for seventh grade or eighth grade, um, we're starting at kind of the fifty thousand foot level, and we're saying uh, if if someone were to send their kid to this school, we'd like to be able to say here are five questions that are so crucial uh, to someone's uh, ability to think critically about things that matter. Um, that your child will not only encounter them next year in, say, fourth grade, um, but will encounter them at uh, grade level, appropriate levels, Mm -hmm. all the way through our program. Um, So uh, this is an interesting thing. We've brought the kids into this discussion because our kids who have been here a year or two are pretty decent philosophers on their own. Uh Um, We have a list. We have an exhaustive list of questions that we pull from, and that's on our website. And so we're working on saying, okay, out of this list of 
you know, might be 50 questions covering political philosophy, mm-hmm. ethics, metaphysics, epistemology. Um, we don't use those terms a lot with the kids, but all, all the different sort of official fields of philosophy. You know, what are, what are the five that we'd like to see hit over and over again? Because we don't, we really, really don't suffer under the illusion, labor under the illusion that uh, uh, you do something once with a kid, even if you do it for a month, let's say in sixth grade, um, that it's going to be there when they're 30. Um, however, I've taken in, in my own practice, my own teaching here and prior to here, uh, when I've taken a semester with kids to tackle one question and really had each of them lean into their own personal position on that philosophical question, um, I meet those kids again at 35, mm-hmm. and they still remember what their position was on mm-hmm. cultural relativism. They remember if they were a relativist or a universalist. They may even remember that one kid who had that crazy idea that they really disagreed with. Um, so we need to, you know, it's a, a very much a less is more approach where tackling just a couple of questions, uh, and doing it right. Um, you don't, you don't rush through and, and you need to have a program that's flexible enough that, uh, if at the end of the semester, we're still, the kids still aren't where they need to be with that. Um, we can keep talking about that question. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of talk right now at the school as we develop this deeper learning model um, about how to have those fifty thousand foot questions in the room, along with say the Civil War. Yeah. Right. Along with you know H two S O four. Had an amazing uh, high school uh, U S history teacher who actually taught the Civil War as uh, yes, a conflict between North and South and industrialized and agrarian and all that stuff that, that we had hammered into us. And that's about the end of what I can recite. John's better. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, taught, he actually taught it as a, a problem in, um, in how historians think about uh, uh, the causes of, of, of events like that. And so the were, yes, they were learning about Gettysburg and Appomattox and, 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 and all of that, but they were also struggling at the 50,000-foot level with whether history is driven more by material factors or more by ideological factors. Mm-hmm. So they may not become you know, Civil War historians, but they can, at age 35, 45, 55, um, employ that big question that question about what drives history in general, uh, if they can apply that to their understanding of what's going on in the world or, uh, you know, something that may uh, uh, be relevant to, to whatever work they're doing, um, I think that's the prize. And so, so you know, less, it, less is more, right? Um, we're not, you know, we, we like content, so content is there, um, but linking the content to the big questions, and these are all challenges that we're all, We've all rolled our sleeves up uh, yeah. and, and we're tackling together. Uh, and again, I'll emphasize along with the kids. So we do design teams where the kids are part of the history through ideas design team. So they're actually creating the curriculum for what we hope will be generations to come. Yep. And it seems like with that type of learning environment, there's a great deal of communication, a great deal of sharing of ideas and getting feedback in your ideas. How do you bring introverts into that milieu? How do they, how do they do? Yeah. By, by virtue of the classes being small. Okay. And by using an assortment of teaching techniques that favor uh, writing, pairing, chalk talks, you know, you write a question on a board, give everyone a marker, right? And everyone responds to the question, but in writing, Right. Yes. Uh, And by by creating classrooms where the person who gets the most reward isn't the one who's talking the loudest. We find that introverted students actually have a framework in which they can participate at a level that feels appropriate to them. And and we can get their their voice out without generating an awkwardness without generating a, an anxiety. And, you know, the biggest class that we'll have would be about 10. That's a much more congenial environment for an introverted student than a class of 40. Yes, absolutely. All those things taken together, I think, contribute to introverts doing quite well here. 
I'll, I'll just add uh, to that that uh, there's a culture here. The kids allow each other to make mistakes. This isn't, yeah. you know, there, I think there are a lot of classrooms out there, whatever size classroom it is, uh, where there's a culture of of, of laughing at someone because they mispronounce something or yeah. get a fact slightly wrong. Yeah. And uh, some of our kids come in here with that culture, and uh, often often they they uh, abandon that and and get on board simply from the feedback that they get from our, our returning students. So this is, yeah. these are kids who don't want that. There, there's a, you know, they can make a list of things that they had at their old school culturally, uh, et cetera, yeah. um, that, that they don't want to have here. And that's been the case from the beginning. Yeah. Um, so this is, this has been to them sort of an oasis and they want the oasis to, uh, to, to be free of some of these uh, uh, kind of noxious elements that, that, that yeah. got in the way of learning. Um we also will we'll train the, the kids that are more talkative to, um, instead of uh, making declarative statements, to uh, make interrogative uh, statements, to mm-hmm. ask questions. Um, so, so maybe the kid who, who over-talks a little bit uh, becomes uh, deputized as a, uh, a sort of Socratic questioner, um, trying to bring things out of the other kids. It sounds like it's not just about the intellectual curiosity. You're also in the business of character development. There's an acceptance of differences. Kindness is important as well. Yeah. And yeah. We, we talk a lot about that either formally in our, our weekly council or uh, informally in the context of, of what comes up and what happens in class. We're yeah. teaching. We're also uh, encouraging the teachers to, many of them do this already, but to, to uh, I say, break the fourth wall. Like if things are, if things are going weird, going south, going wonky in the class, whether it's a social thing between two kids or nobody seems to be into this thing that I planned and, you know, and I want to tear my hair out. Um, we, we just, we, we, we hit pause and we talk about it. Yep. Uh, and we do that again in that, that small context. We can have a productive conversation and that that's often enough to reset things, but it's also a way to, um, to, to convey those values and, 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 and have the kids uh, give the kids a chance to convey what, what matters to them most in the class. And it's not always what matters the most to the most talkative kid. There may be a silent majority that uh, would like a little more airspace Mm -hmm. (laughs) or a little more time to reflect when questions are posed or a little more time to write as opposed to, to, to talk. Yeah. I love the description on your website about qualia. It says qualia can be compared to an all day intellectual dinner party a place where brainy wordplay, clever argumentation, and surprising ideas come together in the milieu that provokes, entertains, and inspires. Who would not want to go (laughs) to send their kid there? That is so us. I'm so glad that we kind of hit that. We landed on it. Yeah. You really did. That's actually true. Right. That's the kind of website website 4.0. Yeah, exactly. Um, But I think it all rings true for us. And and I think, and I think we, you know, if you come and visit and we we love having visitors, even if we're not selling them anything, they're just curious and want to see. Yeah. Um, We will take you into the classroom and, and uh, you can, you know, judge for yourself whether we, we walk the walk. Yep. You hear it everywhere, Karen. Right. You hear it with the kids who are doing the farm to table elective. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, they're the ones who are, who are working in the garden and making chocolate from scratch. Why would they be talking about this interesting idea from their philosophy of meaning class? But they do. <laughs> that right. happens, right? Kids walking around the campus, just talking, 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 talking. You can hear them at each time they pass you. They're like a, they're like a train. Right, you know? And each time you kind of, you, you tune in, you can sort of see where the conversation's going, right? Oh, okay. They've segued out of that idea, and now they're over on this line. Oh, I wonder if they're going to productively do anything with that line of argument, or if they're going to have to back themselves back out. I don't mm-hmm. think that line goes anywhere particularly. And then you know they come back around, and you hear them again. Oh, yeah, they worked their way out of that, and now they're sort of back on another main line. And really, they're interested in everything. So it could be that you're hearing them talk about some political thing, and then they're talking about some historical thing, and then they're talking about a film, and then they're talking about television, and then they're talking about art, and then, and then, and then, right? Anything, which is kind of exciting if you're the adult in the room, because 
these are kids who are keen to make connections and know that some of the things that they need to know to make the connection, they don't quite have. And so you as the adult then becomes, you become a, a, a helpful facilitator rather than the fount of all knowledge, right? Which by, by the students always putting you into that place of the helpful facilitator, it helps to kind of militate against that sage on the stageness mm -hmm. that, that we don't really want in our practice. Yeah, the best classes uh, for me are, are, are when I, I find myself fading into the background. Indeed. And, and the best planned lessons uh, are, are ones where the kids the kids carry the energy. Um, yeah. we, we like to say uh, to, to the faculty, uh, make the kids do the heavy lifting. Yeah. Right? So you, as a teacher, you think, how can I, or the, the tendency I came into sort of progressive teaching with is, how can I scaffold things so perfectly that every child will succeed? Right. So I'm doing the heavy lifting and kind of work sheetifying to coin right. a phrase that right. is something that 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 maybe uh, you know, maybe a lot of complexity and a lot of opportunity for the, the kid to struggle is lost when I when I make it that easy. Yeah. Um, we'll do days in, in chemistry class where my co-teacher and I uh, will give them a puzzle. Uh, we'll put a big pile of tools in the middle of the room. Um, one was. Uh, would a mole of M&M's, a mole is like a chemical dozen and it's has 20, 23 zeros yep. after it. Um, would a mole of M&M's fit in the school? And uh, Robert and I are here, um, but we can only answer yes, no, or show you where to fit. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the uh, trust, I think, that we have in our kids, whether it's to uh, to carry a deep conversation, uh, yeah. to... to uh, uh, bring interesting ideas out of each other, or or to to tackle a problem that is is messy and doesn't mm -hmm. have a clear recipe or algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, there um, is uh, is very very high, and and, and it's very high. We either attract kids or, or or select kids that have that capacity, or the culture just really shapes them in the first year or so into uh -huh. into oh this is how we do school now, right. It's 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 challenging in a way that feels authentic as opposed to, you know, what the challenge might have been before, which is, you know, who can handle the most boring homework or who can, yeah. who can you know, who can pretend to be happy for the longest uh, during a, you know, a, 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 a grueling and, and inauthentic school day. Yep. Um, so that there's a big, um, big sort of paradigm shift that, that our kids will often go through uh, coming in here and, and what comes out the other side is. Is, is absolutely brilliant and amazing. Yep, yep. Our students go on to great universities and colleges all over the world, and they report back to us that they were exceptionally well-trained, capable of, of hanging in conversations and leading conversations at, at prestigious schools. And we're not much for... for uh, you know, standardized tests and external data models and this kind of stuff. But we take this one and say, that tells us something. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this this innovative approach of really focusing on helping students to develop those connections, to discover themselves, and really prepares them again to navigate a complex world. And I think that you're you really provide that model so beautifully, particularly when you think about kids who may come in struggling in some way, whether it be anxiety or whether it be attention, that that just is not it's a, almost a non-issue in the type of environment that you've provided. And again, it becomes a norm to provide the scaffolding and support that everybody needs to thrive. And then you can really focus on what is important. Yeah, we've got them covered. But in order for them to then thrive in school, they need the same things that every student needs, which is what, in our judgment, we uniquely provide here. An emphasis on long-term development of critical capacity, the application of that capacity in all of the disciplines that you might care about, so that when you're 25 and you find yourself looking at a world problem that you care about, 
you have all of the skills you need to be able to think more deeply about that problem, conceptualize solutions, and bring people along with you to, to solve it or to at least address it, right? We had a student uh, do her symposium. Symposium is a, is a program we have at the end of each semester where students take on a, a, a research project of some kind uh, based on some school-wide theme. They work on it for a couple of weeks. They give a presentation on it. They write a long paper about it, okay? We had a student who, who within the theme of error, talked about environmental justice and how certain regions within Los Angeles that are economically well-off and et cetera, when they complain about environmental challenges, they get their concerns attended to almost immediately. But if a community has less economic resources or is composed primarily of racial minorities, they can complain all day long. They're not going to get any attention from the city council or from anyone else. She did her research and she showed how that works within Los Angeles and then pitched some ideas about ways that we might work to address that. And it was electrifying on campus. This is not a student who in the past would have been electrifying. She was good, but not electrifying, right? Mm -hmm. but, but by virtue of the work that we do and by building up each student individually, it's all we've talked about since, you know, the end of January, right? That it's been, it's been you know, it's been very powerfully present in our, in our work. And we're, we're figuring out ways to, to do more of it. That is very inspiring. And it's one of the reasons why I love, that's the perfect example of why I love the work that you all are doing at Qualia. And, you know, if listeners want to learn more about your work, about your approach and Qualia, what is the best way for them to reach you? Well, they can, they can look at the webpage, you know, www.qualiaschool.org, Q-U-A-L-I-A. They could write to me, john at qualiaschool.org, J-O-N or jim at qualiaschool.org. And we take all inquiries. As Jim said, if you want to come up and have a look, if you're an educator, you're a parent of a, you know, of a kindergartner and you're not, you know, you don't need a middle school right now, but you want to come and see what we do, come on up, right? And any, and any educational professionals, you know, or, or uh, uh, you know, ad, uh, adjunct people, come on in. We'll take anyone around. I've got a couple of tours just today. I would just add that we uh, we have expanded to include online students. Um, Indeed. So we had a, a who was in Ohio. Yep. And so uh, we're we're happy to talk to people uh, uh, in the uh, sort of highly curious, gifted. Uh, if you just think your kid sounds like a match, but he's never been labeled anything, that's yep. great too. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, from, uh, from uh, any of the any of the fifty states, and, and yep. uh, we could, you know, time time differences allowing, we'd be happy to have kids from other countries as well. Yep, it enhance, inevitably enhances our our students' experience in the physical classroom. Yep, and we're pretty good at at hybrid. Yep. Yeah. Wonderful, Jim and John. Thank you so much for being here. It has been a pleasure speaking to you both, and thanks so much for sharing this information about your school and with, about this really innovative approach with our listeners. Thanks again. We're grateful for the opportunity, Karen. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Today, we talked about ways that we can foster intellectual curiosity, which is essential for learning. If you want to learn more about this approach, be sure to reach out to Jim or Dr. Cassie. Their information is in the show notes. And be sure to get on our email list by going to childnexus.com. Our emails will keep you connected to us and you will know when we host more conversations like this one. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. For more resources, visit us online at childnexus.com.